It's a new day on Deep Space Nine, and Dr. Julian Bashir is taking tea. Not alone if our newcomer has anything to do with it, as a cardigan comes over to join him and introduce himself. Meet Garak, who we'll be referring to as Plain Simple Garak after being adopted by Channel Patron Admiral Ross Slavin. Plain Simple Garak eyes Bashir with the look of somebody who's found an interesting new toy and is thinking of all the delightful ways he could play with it. Bashir tries to turn the conversation towards rumours of Plain Simple Garak being a spy, probably so he can pretend his nervous fumbling is due to fear rather than being overwhelmed by the raw sexual tension. He's taken aback by the suggestion, or pretends to be, and assuring Bashir that he's nothing more than a tailor, departs after remarking that it's good to have made a new… friend. After he's left, Bashir does the same and goes to Ops. He wastes no time in sharing that plain, simple Garak joined him for tea, ostensibly to talk to O'Brien about him possibly being a spy, but maybe also to brag that he was just approached by Deep Space Nine's most desirable top. There's no time for Bashir's love life, though, as we've got a situation. A cardigan ship is in Bajoran space and trying to kaboom a small Bajoran ship to boot. That's a bit rude, and Cisco gives them a call to tell them to knock that shit off. The call is ignored, and some more pooping hits the Bajoran ship. Time for a bit of teleporting, and none too soon either, as the ship finally gives up and explodes a bit. The newcomer introduces himself as Tanner and requests asylum before recognising Kira. I suspect this is about to get messy. Kira explains to Sisko that Tana was a member of the Bajoran Resistance with her back when the Cardigans were still occupying the planet, though Tana was part of a somewhat more serious group called the Kon Ma. That would certainly explain why they're after him, and why they're calling now to demand that he be handed over. Sisko tells them to dock, before having O'Brien find a way to delay them while we all pop down to the infirmary. On the way, Kira explains that okay, the Kon Ma may have been a bit extreme even for extremists, and okay, they might have murdered some Bajoran politicians a bit, but bringing home Bajor's most volatile elements might be an opportunity. She doesn't say what kind of opportunity, though I imagine having a group of killers on call just in case the cardigans kick off again would certainly be a useful deterrent. Let's ask the guy himself, shall we? Bashir says he's taken a right pasting over the years, with some of it being administered by the cardigans for the lols, but he's well enough to answer questions. Kira tries to jump in, and Sisko decides she might be more hindrance than help in finding the truth, so politely invites her to bugger off. Tana's not shy about who and what he is, or that he'd done some real bad shit, but he now seems a bit disillusioned by it all. Revenge may be a dish best served cold, but any meal gets boring if it's all you eat. The way he tells it, he's about ready to call it a day. Kira's of the opinion that Sisko's making a mistake by not welcoming Tana with open arms. That's why she's calling a Starfleet Admiral to voice her concerns, something that may very well come back to bite her on the arse if things don't go the way she expects. It happens a lot quicker than I'd anticipated, too. After Sisko has a little chat with O'Brien, during which he's told that handing anybody over to the Cardigans would end badly for the subject, he's called by the Admiral Kira contacted. Not for a bollocking, but to warn him that Kira might be a problem. To be fair, she might not be wrong. Kira's visiting Tana in the infirmary to check up on him, and after explaining that she doesn't like Sisko, she says she won't allow Tana to be taken by the Cardigans, no matter what. Speaking of which, we finally let them onto the station. The boss is pissy about being kept waiting, and his mood isn't improved by Sisko telling him that he's decided to grant asylum to Tana, at least for now. And maybe he'll be the first of many. While Tana is bluntly sceptical of the Federation being here and Kira's involvement with it all, he assures her that he's done with the Kon Ma. And maybe there are others who'll do the same, he says, assuming Kira can come through on her attempts to secure amnesty for them with the new Bajoran government. Well, gee, maybe the government would be a bit more open to the idea if you hadn't fucking murderized some of them. We've got a bit of a security problem. Two new guests are refusing to give up their weapons, so Odo goes to investigate. They're Lurser and Bator, a pair of Klingon sisters who could be generously described as proper fucking dodgy. Whatever's going on with today's story, their presence likely means it'll get even shadier. They eventually hand over their toys, or at least the ones we know about, but Odo thinks telling Sisko might be wise. That's a fair assessment, given that they started a Klingon civil war and are wanted by them, but they haven't pulled any serious shit here yet, so Sisko says we can't just throw them in the brig like Ferengi children. We'll have to wait until they start something. 
It won't be long from the looks of things. All eyes are on them in quarks, and even plain simple Garrick has taken an interest while he toys with Bashir some more. Tana's arrival sparks a bit of action, and Lursa and Bator leave with him while being watched by Odo. To a storage area of some kind we go, the sort of place where you can make ethically questionable deals and only be overheard by rats. Whatever's being traded involves enough money that Tana couldn't carry it on him. It's on the way, he says, and will arrive tomorrow. The meeting ends after a bit of threatening, and they all leave, all except the rat, of course, who turns into Odo. Kira's heard about Sisko's decision to provide asylum, and thinks she's managed to arrange amnesty for members of the Khan Ma who are willing to pack it all in. In fact, she says there are two who've agreed to come to the station right now if Sisko will grant them asylum as well. He agrees, and she thanks Sisko for his continuing help, admitting that she was wrong and providing a new beginning for them both. Which Sisko immediately pisses on by telling her that he knows about trying to go over his head and threatening her if she ever does it again. Odo's news isn't going to cheer him up either. He tells Sisko about the meeting and incoming payment, something Sisko concludes is being brought by the two for whom he just granted asylum. And things might get even messier. Lursa and Bator are visiting plain, simple Garrick, rumour that he's a spy for his people having reached their ears. That's why they want to know how much Tana will be worth to the cardigans if they hand him over. Why settle for getting paid once when you can get paid twice? Kira's managed to sway enough politicians to secure amnesty for any former Conma, and is telling Tana as much. He compliments her political acumen, only it's not a compliment so much as a judgement of who she's become, something he came here to discover. Oh, and the giving up terrorism thing was a lie too. Well, sort of. He's still Con Ma and fighting, but in a different way. And Kira can prove to him that she's still fighting for Bajor too, rather than being a Federation stooge, by providing a new shuttle. He says he's got a plan that'll give Bajor independence once and for all, and nobody will get murderized either, honest. All she has to do is trust the guy who lied to her twice. Speaking of subterfuge, plain simple Garak is joining Bashir once more. Rather than dance around things as he did before, he's instead very plain about the arrival of a certain pair of terrorists, and he thinks he and Bashir together may be able to uncover the truth in a way that the others may not. At least that's what he's intimating when he invites Bashir to his shop at a very specific time later that evening. For a very smart man, Bashir proves particularly dense and doesn't initially understand the implication. Either that or his mind was on something else. Plain, simple Garak again repeats his request to meet, and Bashir seems to grasp the situation and leave. Or maybe he just wants an excuse for them to be alone somewhere. To Ops we go, where Sisko and Kira are dancing around each other as well, only without the romantic undercurrent. He's trying to probe if Kira's part of whatever's going on, and she vouches for the two new arrivals, though perhaps not with quite as much confidence as she's trying to project. Bashir interrupts for guidance about what to do, and after explaining what just happened to him, Sisko suggests he should go through with it. Either Bashir will find out about some terrorists, or he'll get rid of some of his pent-up energy. It's a win-win. Kira's having a crisis of conscience and needs to share it with someone. Odo's her choice, the excuse for her visit being some security arrangement, but it's obvious to him that there's more to it, and it takes little effort prompting her into the real reason. She's cagey about the details, and explains she's going to have to betray someone regardless of the outcome, but it sounds like she's decided what's right and is simply trying to convince herself of it. Odo knows the details already, of course, and from her behaviour manages to guess what she's trying to do. So he takes the decision out of her hands and calls Sisko down there for her. It's time for a fitting. Actually, it's a little past time for a fitting, and plain simple Garak makes no attempt to hide his frustration when he forces some clothes into Bashir's hands and sticks him in a changing room. The reason for his haste becomes apparent when Lursa and Bator arrive to update him on betraying Tana. They've agreed on a price, and plain simple Garak manages to persuade some more details from them, rather expertly so, in fact. They tell him that they're selling Tana some chemical bollocks. Must be pretty serious, as they're going to perform the exchange on the dark side of a moon. They say the cardigans can have him after the trade is concluded. Off they trot, and Bashir is released from his curtained prison. A bit more chatting reveals the chemical bollocks in question can be used to make a very potent firework indeed, if stuck in a certain piece of equipment. 
And the bad news is that the cardigans were chasing Tana because he'd nicked that very same piece of equipment. Kira spilled her guts, and now we all need to figure out what to do. We don't have enough evidence to just stick them all in a cell, so the best course of action is letting it play out. And Kira thinks that means her being present for the trade, as any excuse for not being there would arouse suspicion. Cisco doesn't like it, but can't argue the logic, so he and O'Brien will be sat in a different mega shuttle, ready to grab them all. As to the cardigans turning up, well, we'll have to play that by ear. It's a shit plan, but it's the one we've got, so let's get on with it. Tana and Kira arrive at the meeting point, where Lursa and Bitor pop into view. Over they come with the promised goods, and are paid with latinum before buggering off. Kira's questions are largely ignored by Tana, but it doesn't really matter now he's holding the evidence. Sisko decides now is the time to stop things, though he may have left it a touch late. That cardigan ship from earlier is inbound too, and we're hardly in a position to prevent them if they decide to use force. Both Sisko and the cardigan ship have been noticed by Tana and Kira. Her attempts to grab a gun go pear-shaped when he gives her a bonk on the noggin and takes one for himself. He tells her to set a course for Deep Space Nine, and threatens to kaboom them right here if she won't, an act that would destroy nearby Bajoran colonies. Sisko's in pursuit, but catching them's going to be a bit difficult, as they're both driving the same type of ship, which is quite a serious flaw in the plan now I think about it. We're in weapons range though, apparently, and Sisko threatens them a bit. Tana threatens him back, as any attack will set off the firework, and that would be a real bad day for anybody in the area due to shitting radiation all over the place. A call to the Cardigans for assistance provides only the news that they won't arrive in time, and a bit of gloating from the dick in charge, so it looks like we're on our own. There's a slight change of plan though, Tana's not going to Deep Space Nine, he's going to the wormhole. He thinks making that inaccessible will stop Bajor being of interest to anybody, which is bollocks, but we'll get to that in the summary. Regardless, Kira's not having any of it. She flies towards it like he asks, but rather than flying past, instead goes inside. They have a bit of a wrestle as they fly through it, and Kira manages to prevent him from launching the bomb until they're out the other side. It kabooms in what can only be described as an entirely underwhelming manner, raising the question of just how devastating it would have been in the first place, but let's ignore that for now. Sisko and O'Brien pop out of the wormhole behind them, and he ends any threat of a hostage situation by saying if Tana doesn't surrender to him right now, he's just going to let the cardigans take care of it. That's not an appealing prospect under any circumstances, and Tana decides he'd rather take Bajoran justice instead. Back at the station, Odo takes him into custody. Kira tries to reason with Tana and explain that the situation on Bajor has outgrown his methods. He's not listening, though, instead calling her a traitor, and we leave her to ruminate on her actions, past and present, until the next adventure. Okay, let's address the elephant. Tana thinks kabooming the wormhole will remove any interest from the Federation in being here. But the Federation came to help out before the wormhole was discovered, so that logic doesn't work. I suppose you could argue that he's out of the loop, but he seems pretty well informed on the running of things, up to and including knowledge of who was the Bajoran liaison on the station. The idea that somebody with access to that data didn't know the timeline for our arrival simply doesn't carry water. With that out of the way, let's get on with the rest. That Bajoran woman. It's the term Admiral Rollman uses to describe Kira, and it plugs in a bit too smoothly with what I said in the last video about Starfleet perhaps seeing unaffiliated species as lesser. Kira is an official representative of a planetary government, the formal conduit of that authority on a station where we are technically guests. To be referred to so dismissively is quite the indicator of just what Starfleet really thinks. Add to that the threat from Sisko to have Kira's head on a platter if she goes over his again, and it paints a rather unfortunate picture. Again, this is a Bajoran station, we're just administrators, at least as far as the paperwork says. Kira's the appointed eyes and ears of the Bajoran government, so she's the one with the real power. You could even argue that calling Admiral Rollman rather than her own people was a courtesy instead of an insult, giving Starfleet the chance to deal with a perceived problem before making her displeasure official. All in all, the Federation comes out of this looking like complete dicks. To the story itself, and it's a good little introduction to Kira's backstory. We know she used to fight the Cardigans, and we know that war, especially against an overwhelming foe, can be real fucking messy. 
It's not particularly surprising, then, that she has some skeletons in her closet. Her crisis of allegiance between what she was and what Bajor needs now does a solid job of showing us her morals and capability for introspection. Being able to accept that what was true before may not be true now is a difficult thing, especially when that thing has defined you for your entire life. She might know that Tana's wrong, but his judgement will still carry weight. And while we're on the topic of judgement, we're introduced to her trusting the opinion of Odo. The pilot showed us they have at least a cursory knowledge of each other, but this story tells us it goes further. She chooses him as both moral compass and confidant, implying a significant history between them. We could say that further undermines the clumsy exposition Odo gave to her about his history in the pilot, but we'll be generous and assume it's due to him being private. The main attraction, though, at least for me, is the introduction of plain, simple Garak. He's delightful and superbly played by Andrew Robinson. The fact that he also brings added political intrigue is simply the cherry on top, so to speak. Overall, it's a decent enough primer on the political complications of Bajor, and a good start on exploring some of the main cast. End of episode. All right, this time. Here we go, here we go, here we Oh, I've missed it again. For the love of all the gods, can you land this thing or not? Why, well, is this my job? You're a bloody starship computer. How the fuck do you not know how to land a ship? I can land a ship. A big ship. This is not a big ship. This is a small ship. If Voyager is a cruise liner, this is a Ford Cortina. Maybe we could just stay on here and keep circling the station. That's not an option. Why not? We've got a replicator and enough fuel to keep this up for longer than either of us will be alive. Because if we keep flying around, they are going to assume we are dangerous and shoot us. Oh, come on. This is the Federation. They don't just shoot at things without a good reason. Uh, computer? Yes? What does target lock detected mean? 